And that's in half an hour. Between now and then, Quentin Letts returns with another programme questioning the continuing relevance of some of Britain's cherished institutions. Tonight, he asks, what's the point of the Methodists? Welcome to Ranter's Corner, and I mean it. I'm in Cheshire at a Museum of Methodism, and around me are various exhibits about the early 19th century Methodist preachers who stood on carts in the open air and preached, technical term, ranted, at the masses. In its heyday, Methodism was an itchy, invigorating force, not just in religious life, but also in politics here and abroad. It defied, challenged, transformed the establishment. It laid the foundations of trade unionism, the Labour Party, and maybe even Thatcherism. Along the way, it gave us temperance and some of the great marching hymns of Christendom. Yet, Methodism has waned. It has lost a third of its members in the last ten years. So, should it go gently into the good night, throw in its lot with the C of E, or does it still have something distinctive to offer? What's the point of the Methodists? <laughs> No, you do it, love. Want me to do it? Yeah, yeah, it's easier. So what's the question again? What's the point of a Methodist? Probably, it's in the word. We have a method. To share God with everybody. For me, it's, it's about social justice. Transforming the world. To take forward John and Charles Wesley's original thoughts. Sons of a Lincolnshire rector, the Brothers Wesley began a holy club in Oxford, which earned them the mocking title Methodist for their methodical approach to life and the Bible. Their movement is now a worldwide church with 80 million members. But John and Charles themselves remained Church of England clergymen to the end. The point of Methodism for them was not to found a new institution, but to reform from within a flaccid Anglican establishment. The C of E at that time was corrupt, larded with land and livings, more gripped by cathedral politics than ministering to the poor. Lord Griffiths, Leslie Griffiths, is superintendent minister of the London chapel John Wesley founded in 1778. Well, he was a little man, five foot two. He had in some way absorbed all the best of a formal Anglican priest's training but had, on top of that, um, somehow found an extra ingredient that uh, came out of his conversion and turned him into a man who simply looked in all directions at the same time for opportunities to share the message he had to give. You count, in his days it was called, you are saved, but you count, you are valued in the sight of your maker, and I want to find the right way to tell you that. And um, the, the established church at that point had slightly forgotten that message. Oh, they were antagonistic. Indeed, they summed it up with one word, and in the 18th century, the age of reason, it was the one kind of almost a swear word if applied to a, a clergyman. He was an enthusiast. Uh -oh. Enthusiasm was considered <laughs> to be a sin, and uh, he was an enthusiast. This Methodist enthusiasm exploded in communal singing. For many Methodists, that remains their distinctive stamp. The fluorescence of Victorian hymn writing was powered by John's brother Charles, who wrote 6,000 hymns. Hark the Herald! OK, so this is the Foundry Chapel, named for the place where Methodism started. An old government foundry it was. Lovely little place. And a lovely place where we have an early morning communion every Sunday. And we've got Paul Leddington right on this it's old organ. What, what age is this organ, Paul? Oh, well, this is an 18th century instrument um, belonging to Charles Wesley and very similar to the sort of instruments that Handel would have been familiar with. And how does this little beauty play? She sounds pretty good. It's still going very nicely. So one keyboard. One keyboard. One it's only and, and just two. over four octaves. Two stops. There's a little flute stop. Very pretty. And uh, a principal, which is a metal stop. You can put them together and you get two stops. What are the best known Methodist hymns? I think one of the key hymns uh, has to be Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. There are several tunes to it. There's one that I was playing called Lydia when you came in. Yes. And there's another one called Lingham, which Methodists like to sing. Yes. 
Um, quite jaunty. But if you they go, go in for a bit of syncopation. Oh, don't absolutely. They? Whereas and, the, uh, the traditional Anglican was a bit, a bit yeah. suspicious of syncopation. I mean, prob- probably if you go into Anglican Cathedral. I mean, yesterday yes. morning I played it in Coventry Cathedral, and this was the tune. Which is very nice, Richmond, but it's it's far more stately, isn't it, yes. and stoic than the Lingham and Lydia Much tunes, like, which I, 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 I like both. Well, it's all great fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but what? So th- there's this liveliness about. Uh, Methodist hymns. What effect did these these hymns have? I would have thought it was an enthusiasm, a great involvement, and a real sense of emotion that came through so much of it. That word enthusiasm again. Hymns gave congregants a voice. They democratised worship. It all became a bit much for Church of England snoots in their chancels. And after John Wesley's death in 1791, the gulf between Anglicans and Methodists widened still further. It all became a bit much for the loftier Methodists, too. As they became more respectable, they found themselves less eager to rattle the establishment cage. So they stopped their practice of open-air preaching. Women who had been permitted to preach were denied the pulpit. As happens with splinter groups, further splintering ensued. The movement that had set out to reform the Church of England spawned another movement, which sought to revive Methodist radicalism. Lovely day in Cheshire, near Crewe. Here we are at the Anglesey Brook Chapel and Museum. Jill Barber, you're the curator here. Yes. Tell me all about this place. Right, well, we are the Museum of Primitive Methodism. Primitive Methodism was a working-class movement that began here on the North Staffordshire-Cheshire border at the beginning of the 19th century. And this 19th century milk cart is just the sort of thing that preachers would use to stand on. Yes. And you can see the pictures behind it. Ranters of, Corner. That's right. That Sounds was, like the sort of place parliamentary sketch writers get. <laughs> Why Ranters? Ranters was the nickname that the primitive Methodists were given very much because of their enthusiasm. They were noisy. This is all about the first camp meeting. That it was an American idea that came over. A bit like Billy Graham? Yes, yes, very much. What year is this? 1807 was 1807. the very first camp meeting. So it was a real sort of fairground atmosphere. Like Glastonbury? Was... Yes, it was. And the primitive Methodists arose in this, this area where there's no church at all, completely as they saw outside any knowledge of the love of God. And so the open-air preaching was a response to going to where the people were, going back to the early form of Methodism as practised by John Wesley. John Wesley's mission was to reach out to touch the poor, convert them, educate them, sober them up. But, high Tory that he was, Wesley retained a Conservative's caution. He had been horrified by events in revolutionary France, where the term left-wing originated. But the primitive Methodists were undoubtedly that. Yes, lefties. These were illiterate men. They'd started work at five or six years old. So at first, through the chapels, they learned to read. And through the chapels, they learned the skills, public speaking, because they became local preachers. There was no training. As soon as you hadn't experienced the love of God, stand up and share your story, brother or sister. So you learned how to speak, how to uh, get a crowd. And they took the organisation they knew, the way Methodist chapels were organised, into the workplace, and that became the basis of the trade union movement. They gather every year in the Dorset village of Toll Puddle to commemorate six bold men, five of them Methodists, who in 1834 organised a union, fought pay cuts and were sent to Australia as a punishment. The General Secretary of the TUC is always there to make a speech. What, for Francis O'Grady, is the point of Methodism? Well, not just our history, our presence still draws on a lot of the values that Methodists support. Equality, fellowship, a sense of compassion for those who are worse off than ourselves. And I think the trade union movement owes a lot of its tradition to that sense that any one of us can get up, can lead others and be prepared to stand up for what we believe in, not just in church, but in the real world as it is now, and to to fight for a better life for all.
Did Methodism ferment political unrest, or did Methodism provide a steam vent? Did its revivalist meetings become a wholesome alternative to France's sans culotte, and thus save England from the revolutionary fervor across the Channel? Historians disagree, but they do agree that both in ideology and in organization, the Labour Party, founded in 1900, owes much to Methodism, more, Harold Wilson reckoned, than it does to Marx. You wouldn't think so today, though. Labour's Meg Munn is MP for Sheffield Healy, and she's a Methodist. I would say that there's far less, perhaps now, of a, a formal link between the Methodist Church and the Labour Party, but there are plenty of people, certainly within the Methodist Church, who would associate themselves with Labour values. Perhaps it goes a little bit less the other way round, but that tradition of social action and being concerned about the community is still at the heart of Methodism. And there's this all-party Methodist group, isn't there? There is indeed. Is this a bit a big organisation? <laughs> Um, no. A big congregation, no? No, no. To, to, to be fair, we actually have to ask a few Anglicans to loan us their names in order to get the qualifying 20. So we are a small, but I would say perfectly formed group. But this is sad, isn't it? Because here is a church which has really had a lot to do with the setting up of the Labour movement. Mm -hmm. And yet now it's, it's shriveled a bit. Yes, that probably is sad. Maybe we need to stir up more Methodists to get active actually in politics rather than just within their communities. Don't forget, I had a Methodist upbringing, and in those days, Methodism was very, very strict. Margaret Roberts, daughter of a strictly Methodist grocer, preached on the student circuit long before she turned to politics. And Methodism was, you were brought up, really, to work, and not to um, enjoy yourself too much other than working. You know, you never went to things for the purpose of enjoyment. You got your enjoyment by doing things for other people. You were taught to be responsible, to be truthful, to support the police, to live within your income, to be a good citizen, to do things for other people. Just the way everyone should. And those standards have stayed with me all my life. Labour Methodists may bristle at the suggestion that Thatcherism embodies principles of their church, but... Self-reliance, aspiration, a hand-bagging iconoclasm towards vested interests, were these principles not snortingly Methodist? Professor Linda Woodhead of Lancaster University. She has a lot of very typical Methodist values. You know, she believes in individual freedom of choice and your own responsibility for getting on in life. Very, very Methodist attitudes. And also being judicious and responsible and sober. She did this somewhat typical thing, yes, of growing up in Methodism and then leaving and joining the Church of England. And that has been a fairly common path in Methodism. And, and, and the Church of England is just better resourced. It has more money, better buildings, more social influence. And so it's going to be tempting to people to make that move. And of course, Margaret Thatcher, she made that move to Anglicanism when she uh, got married, when she moved south, when she had a bit more money. Mm. Is it that Methodism is a less congenial place for people who somehow consider themselves to be uh, the haute bourgeoisie? That's interesting, isn't it? I, mean, I think the best way of thinking of Methodism historically is not just as a religion. Methodism was part of a whole package of social, political and economic and religious commitments. It was tied up with criticism of the establishment, establishment religion and, and the class establishment. But the classes that it nurtured, the artisan and respectable working classes that it had so much of a role in creating, those classes take a very different form these days. And the success of Methodism in raising people to higher statuses in society can mean that, like Mrs Thatcher, they then leave it and go to the old establishment, paradoxically. Methodism may not be compatible with today's left, hooked as it is on the politics of welfareism. But how about post-Thatcher Toryism? Is that any more Methodist? Does Methodism find an expression in politics today? Carl McCartney spent most of his teenage Sunday mornings at Little Neston Methodist Church in Birkenhead, Merseyside. He's now Conservative MP for Lincoln, Wesley Country. Well, I certainly think the ability for there to be no boundaries for people to, to get on, if you like. Certainly within the Methodist Church there isn't. You know, that's something that I think is perhaps born through to conservative principles, which is there should be no limit on aspiration. But then Christianity itself is probably quite close to conservatism, I'd say, in the fact that, you know, as a good conservative, I believe everybody 
you know, has a right to get on, but also that we should provide a safety net for those who can't provide for themselves. And when you stand up in the House of Commons, in the chamber, do you still feel the tug of Sunday school? Do you still feel the strength of that teaching that you had? Yes, because it sets your moral tone, perhaps, for perhaps as well, also arguing uh, for something that at the time might not be the majority view. So standing up for what you believe in, which is probably one of the, the firmest principles I have, is probably part of the Christian teaching that I was brought up with. Standing up at all is difficult for some MPs, given the number of bars in the Palace of Westminster. When I asked Carl McCartney to name the point of Methodism, the first word he came out with was temperance. In the popular imagination, Methodists may still be associated with their 19th century stand against the demon drink, summed up in a poster I spotted with Jill Barber at Anglesey Brook Museum. Jill, here's a, here's a song being laid out. Uh, have you put this out specially for my visit? I don't know. Uh, it's a temperance song, and it's making me feel very guilty. Here's the second verse. No drink we use, but water pure, and have few aches and pains to cure. Good health is ours, and prospects bright. Our heads are clear, our hearts are light. Terrific stuff. Who was, who was promoting the temperance? When did this come into Methodism? Well, the temperance movement began in Preston in 1830, and it was taken up more quickly by the primitive Methodists than by the Wesleyan Methodists because they were the working men who really were affected by this right. because often their wages were paid in pubs. They saw it as a way of the masters keeping them uh, down. So the Methodists are, are saying, get a grip of your life, are they? Resist these publicans who are uh, the wicked employers and, and who, are, who are controlling you. That's right, yes, very much about taking control of yourselves. It's about self-improvement. And there it goes on. We ne'er must heed the tempter's call, but from strong drink must turn away, nor from the path of virtue stray. And is this still a part of Methodism, the temperance idea? No. What Methodists say today, it's about moderate drinking, about being responsible in your drinking. Certainly encouraged to think about total abstinence, but it's not an imperative. So it's you're allowed not. a schooner of sherry, but, but resist the mass alcohol. But, but yes, yeah. <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. Like seaweed in a swell, public mores move. If an institution wishes to survive, it must decide whether or not to adapt to changing attitudes. Does Methodism forego some of its principles because they no longer appeal? What does it say now about gambling, against which it railed for so long? Rachel Lampard is policy advisor to the Methodist Church. If we stand up and we say, gambling is evil, nobody's really going to listen to us. But if we can stand in the public square and say, actually, we need to be talking about the harm that gambling can cause to some people, so what does this mean in terms of good regulation? We're actually able to get a place in the public square much, much more. So we're going to hear a bit more about that sort of thing, are we, from the Methodists in, in coming years? We have been talking about it fairly loudly for the last ten years. Not quite loudly enough to break through, but, but maybe that's because when the National Lottery came out, the Methodists said, oh, we don't want anything to do with that. But then, after a couple of years, oh, we, maybe we will accept lottery cash. So there was a softening, there was a slight rowing away from the exciting extremism of <laughs> I think it's more realistic to say we've, we've become more nuanced in terms right. of what's going on. Very if political. You, if, you think, if you think back ten years to when the Gambling Act came in, which introduced massive deregulation in the gambling industry, it was the Methodist Church and the Salvation Army who were the only ones who were standing up to the government and to the industry saying, actually, we need to be talking about the harm that this can do. What do we need to do to protect the vulnerable and protect children? It's and disgraceful, isn't it, that the Labour movement wasn't more behind you? There you are, you've given so much to the Labour movement and they've gone and stitched you up on this. I think there were a lot of Methodists who certainly had a problem with what was being proposed, but we were the only ones who were standing up at that point and I think we did manage to make some significant changes to the legislation as a result. It's a shame the country didn't notice. But news management and story spinning has never been a forte of the modest Methodists. The Labour Party must have got that from somewhere else. Mrs Thatcher? Perhaps Methodists could do with an outsider's advice on how to promote themselves. I nominate shy, retiring George Pitcher, journalist, Anglican priest and spin doctor. 
Are the Methodists good at getting their, their message out? I mean, the main newspapers, the, the Methodist Recorder, let me just call it up on... Uh, look at their website here, because um, uh, that's, yes. that's modern communications, isn't it? Here we well, are. You brought, all the mod you brought, cons. A, you brought a laptop uh, picture. Uh, 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 here we are. Methodist Recorder. Shall I press on yes, that and do. see what we get? Oh, Click on it. You don't press we, on it. We get a rather boring page. Oh, just, that is dull. That just tells us its address uh, and the telephone number for advertisements and uh, uh, an address for subscriptions. At the that, heart of Methodism. Well, where, where would you expect it to be? In the yeah. spleen of Methodism? I don't know. <laughs> that's not a very user-friendly web page. It isn't. What should they be doing? I think newspapers are a bit spent, really. Other you than, mustn't say that to me. <laughs> other, than, other than the fine organ you work for, uh, uh, but... Quentin. But really, they should be online, shouldn't they? Getting their message across to the youth of today, none of whom are spending pound sixty or whatever it is to pick up a newspaper. They're online. pound sixty, I think. I haven't bought one since 1978. Methodism did, alas, make certain headlines in recent months. The Reverend Paul Flowers, a Methodist minister, was chairman of the co-op bank and promptly helped bring it to its knees, though not in a godly way. He was also convicted of possessing drugs and became something of a national joke. Crystal meths, poor man. Newspapers cackled with glee and ran little information boxes about Methodism's decline. British Methodists now number little more than 200,000. Professor Linda Woodhead. It's declining horribly fast. It's declined by a third in just in the last 10 years, so a really an enormous rate of decline. It's a bit like an iceberg that's just crumbling into the sea and there's just nothing coming up behind it. So it's literally dying out. It's got an aged profile and those older people are not being replaced by younger people. So what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to the poor old Methodists? Are they just going to dwindle? And will we, in 50 years' time, have the very last Methodist? Well, who knows, because you can never extrapolate. I mean, on current trends, they will disappear very soon. But when institutions, organisations go into that state of apparently terminal decline, it changes what they do, and they may act in new ways that will bring about a change. But what's this? Hold the front page. The Methodists have a new church in Warrington. It's called New Song, and it's going gangbusters. Last month, it welcomed 40 new members. Its lead singer, uh, I mean stand-up comic, I mean minister, is Jackie Belfield. I'm oh, sorry. Was that a bit of a surprise? Are you OK then, Bolton? Are you all right? I know it's hard to admit. We found that people were coming to New Song that had no other church expression. and We had a responsibility to care for them and nurture them. And so from the idea of five years ago of having cake and coffee and music has come this growing church community of people who want to be together to worship God and to grow together in faith. I think it's fair to say that in not just Methodist churches but most churches we know the process of closing them, we know that verbatim. The process of starting a new church, that kind of made us frown a little bit and scratch our heads. So in the end we decided to follow the same process as what you'd have to do to close a church. Do you need to present who you are, what you are, what your intentions are to your local circuit meeting. They then hear that opinion and vote on whether that's right or not. And um, that's what we've gone through. The point of Methodism, as ever, is social action and song. But Lord help them if the Methodists think moving with the times means ditching Charles Wesley for songs like these. Let's get some survival tips from George Pitcher. So here you are, you're an ex-spin doctor to the Archbishop of Canterbury. I am your client, I am the Methodist Church, I'm saying save us, George. What is your professional advice? Let me say first, Quentin, that I don't think I'm a very good spin doctor because the Archbishop of Canterbury actually fired me. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I might get fired uh, for the following advice, therefore, which is to go, look, we'd be stronger together than we are apart... So let's go for it. Anglicans and Methodists have been eyeing each other up for the best part of 50 years. In 2003, they signed a covenant, committing themselves to working together more closely. They're still talking about what it means in practice. Some arid Anglicans still have difficulty accepting Methodist ministers as proper clergy. Some Methodists still balk at the idea of bishops. But today's C of E has changed. The need for both churches to survive is now concentrating minds. Ken Howcroft chairs the Methodist Conference. 
the most ecumenical place in England is probably Cumbria, where they had foot and mouth, where they had their Keswick shootings, where there have been a number of crises which have forced the churches to work together, and then they realised that they each had the same problem, and in some villages, the parish church and the Methodist church were all about to go out of business simultaneously, leaving no Christian presence, and so they actually need to think about one church taking the lead in one place on behalf of all the churches. Then you come against the problem that the Church of England has said that my ministry, for example, is authentic and valid and fruitful, but because a bishop did not lay hands on me when I was ordained, I cannot preside at a communion service in a parish church. What have you Methodists got against bishops? You've got to have leaders in any church, don't you? You have to have leaders. Our problem is, it's a whole set of history. We defined ourselves for a long time as not being the Church of England and actually having fallen out of the Church of England. And to be frank, the stereotype of bishops living in palaces, ordering people what to do and treating lower class churches with total disdain had enough truth (laughs) about it for that stereotype to keep being reinforced but we said for 40 years we're prepared to have bishops we just have to get around to doing it where do you think it's going to go do you think you will become one yes though it depends what you mean by one if the church of england can become the church in england then methodism can take its place as a movement of people who are highly committed to personal and social holiness inside a wider church but if the church of england stays as the church of England, then the danger is that our own particular genius will get snuffed out. Methodism was never vain. Taking a practical, methodical approach, it marched into barns and factories, exhorting folk to make the most of themselves, to make their lives sing. The Methodist church worldwide may be flourishing, but here in Britain, unless we are to lose a once great institution, our leaders should chew hard on the point of Methodism. Materially, ours may seem a ripe age. We have never been so rich, so fat, so atheistic. Has it brought strength and happiness? Islam prospers by preaching self-discipline. Aspiration, moderation, solidarity, these are also historic Methodist virtues. Today's political parties and the moist Anglican hierarchy have become reluctant to judge Might there not yet be a very modern point for Methodism to inject some radical self-discipline in British life and thus help the poor? Whether or not they organise independently or within the Anglican Communion, I hope that there will always be a positive answer to the Charles Wesley hymn which Methodists still sing without irony at their annual conference. And are we yet alive? And I'll be yet alive. The Point of the Methodists was presented by Quentin Lentz and produced by Rosie Dawson. 